All right, great. So welcome everyone. I'm Tim Vollmer from the UC Berkeley Library. And my colleague Rachel Sandberg is also joining us. Rachel is the Scarly Communication Officer and Program Director at the library. Uh, and I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment. But uh, Rachel, do you wanna just say hi? Hello everyone. And I have some very important information aside from where you can get portraits of your pets. Um, so I can see that a few of you have been with us all week for our entire publishing uh, workshop series. And I just uh, would ask those of you who have come to all the sessions, shoot us an email because you will be the recipient in approximately one to two months of a very gorgeous library tote bag. Um, they're back ordered at the moment, but um, as, as a commemoration of your making it through the publishing bootcamp series. Um, we have that reward for you. So just shoot us an email when this is all done. Thanks. The swag survives even during COVID. Uh, so as you all heard with the announcement, um, we're gonna be recording the panel discussion today. Uh, so we can share it out with those who weren't able to make it. And we'll post it to YouTube a little bit later on, uh, either today or tomorrow. Um, so just a little bit of information. This panel is hosted by the Office of Scholarly Communication Services within the library. And we're here to help answer questions around a variety of different issues, including copyright in your research and also within instruction and teaching, uh, author's rights and protecting and managing your intellectual property, um, scholarly publishing options and platforms for you, uh, we also touch a lot on open access to research, open data, and open educational resources, among many other things. So this week, we've been hosting a series of publishing-related workshops aimed at graduate students, postdocs, and early career researchers. So on Monday, we hosted a session on what you need to know with regard to copyright and other legal considerations for your dissertation. And we went into how to incorporate other people's content in your writing and also your own rights as an author and how you can share your dissertation when it's complete. Uh, on Tuesday, we focus on some strategies and tools for managing and maximizing the scholarship that you create and share. And we talked about a variety of metrics that researchers use to track their impact. And today we have a great panel discussion on taking your dissertation and turning it into your first book. Uh, after today, we're going to take a break for a few weeks, but we'll come back with a copyright and fair use for digital projects workshop on November 10th. And then also we're hosting a workshop on sharing and publishing data. That's going to be on December 1st. So if you want to register for any of the upcoming workshops, just please go to our website and there's a link there to do that. So today we've got a great lineup of speakers who have generously agreed to share their experiences and information on the process of publishing a scholarly book. Um, we know that there are several of you out there that are working on your dissertation and are likely interested in taking that research into a book length treatment. So our goal today is to do a little bit of demystifying the monograph publishing process a bit and to be able to give you some practical advice across a wide range of considerations, including things like what it'll take to revise your dissertation, how to develop a book proposal, um, providing some tips for interacting with editors, and also how to address some legal considerations in publishing. Now I wanna introduce our panelists for today. So Reina Polivka is Acquisitions Editor for Music, Cinema, and Media Studies at the University of California Press. She joined the UC Press in 2015 and acquires scholarly and trade books in music, film and media studies, sound studies, and cultural studies. Brandy Thompson Summers is an Assistant Professor of Geography and Global Metropolitan Studies at UC Berkeley. Professor Summers is the author of the book, Black in Place, the Spatial Aesthetics of Race in a Post-Chocolate City. It was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. And the book explores how aesthetics and race converge to locate or map blackness in Washington, DC. And Rachel Brook is staff attorney for Authors Alliance. Authors Alliance is a nonprofit organization representing the interests of authors 
who want to take advantage of the digital age and to share their creations with readers, promote the ongoing progress of knowledge and advance the public good. And prior to law school, Rachel worked as a literary agent in a small New York City agency. So just a little bit about the structure of the session. We prepared a short set of questions that we'll ask each panelist and invite them to respond to. We'll start with Raina first, then go to Brandy and then finish with Rachel. At the end, we'll have time for you to ask questions to the panelists too. So hold on to them for that portion of the session. Uh, but one thing you can do is um, if you have a question as we go along, you can post it into the chat and Rachel and I will be monitoring it so we can get to them after the panel. So let's go ahead and stop screen sharing now so it's easier to see our speakers. Okay. So to kick things off, um, let's start with Raina. Uh, Raina, can you give us an overview of the University of California Press? So what sorts of books does the UC Press publish? And a related question, do different university presses specialize in particular subject areas? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And thanks to everyone for participating today. Um, I look forward to the discussions. Um, well, the simple answer to your last question is yes. Uh, every university or academic publisher has um, a distinct set of fo foci, I would say. They have acquisitions editors who focus on specific subject areas and who they themselves have different interests within those subject areas. And so part of your uh, part of the thing you'll be looking for when you're out seeking a publisher for your book is who has who shares your interests in the work that you're doing and what other books are they publishing that would align really nicely next to yours on say a bookshelf. Um, in terms of University of California Press, we've been around um, for over 125 years. Uh, we are the uh, we are one of the top we are among the top five um, prestigious uh, scholarly publishers in the country next to Yale and Harvard, Chicago, and these sorts of presses in terms of our out our, in terms of the number of books that we publish and the revenue that we bring in. And among those top five, we are the only publisher associated with a public university. Um, so that means that we don't have big endowments to pull from. We really are resourceful working with our home institutions in the UC system, as well as with authors to collaborate um, and to be resourceful in getting their books out to a wider audience. We publish um, primarily in the humanities and social sciences, uh, uh, sociology, criminology, history, early history, modern history, American history, uh, American studies. We also publish strongly in music and film, as, as I can attest to, uh, anthropology, um, food studies, classics, um, and we just started a few new lists in environmental studies, in economics, and in kind of this burgeoning field of tech studies. Um, so looking at technology primarily from a social science uh, perspective. Um, we publish monographs. The monograph, of course, is the term used for the, the book that most of you will publish for your first book. This is usually a narrower scholarly study implementing lots of secondary or primary resources, engaging with other scholarly dialogues and discussions. Um, these are typically books written for scholars or students in a particular discipline. Um, we also publish books that we term uh, academic trade books. These are books that reach across the aisle into um, contemporary discussions, for example, about, uh, about uh, kind of temporary or contemporary or zeitgeisty topics. Um, they have a scholarly apparatus, but they're written for a larger audience. We also are growing our trade list. These are books that are meant primarily for general readers. Of course, a general reader of an academic press book is going to be someone who who reads kind of like the New Yorker or um, or or, or um, even Mother Jones or some or, or uh, journals like that, uh, magazines like that. Um, and we also do course books. So books that are really meant for class adoption that are geared towards 
being assigned on syllabi that kind of come with a, a, a syllabus already written into it. Um, so we we acquire in many different subject areas, but we are also acquire different kinds of books as well. Okay, fantastic. Let's move into a bit about the book publication process from the perspective of the press. So say I'm a PhD student with a dissertation and I want to revise it into a book. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the different um, processes. So let's take a look at the book proposal first. Um, so who should a person reach out to if they want to submit a proposal and what should the proposal look like? What should be included? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the acquisitions editor is certainly the person that you would reach out to. And I highly recommend when you're looking at different presses, when you're ready, when you're at that stage, when you're really ready, your, your, your book is, has crystallized in your mind and you're really ready to kind of become the expert in that area. Um, to peruse, uh, I would say conference exhibit halls that you, that you attend, but these are all going virtual lately. Um, and so not knowing what the future holds for all of those in-person conferences, go on to press websites and, and check and just peruse their, 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 their books, their journals, get a sense for the feel of what they're publishing in. Um, and when you feel, and we can talk a little bit more about fit later, I do think that there's a, another question about that. But uh, the person that you would contact is the acquisitions editor. And, the, and a great way to do that is to, um, is, is to simply drop them an email. Now, I will say most acquisitions editors acquire in multiple disciplines and have lots and lots of proposals coming across their desk every day. Um, so the, the challenge for you is really to figure out how to get your proposal to rise to the top of that pile. Um, one thing that I strongly, there's several strategies for that. One is to kind of enlist the help of a mentor or someone with whom you've worked before who has published with that press, who can kind of introduce you. Um, and that, that, that works really well. I often say publishing, um, it's really all about long-term relationships. So whoever you, who, all of my authors that I work with, we, uh, that is usually a relationship that has taken many years to blossom and cultivate from talking about their project, seeing the, the project take shape and form, sending it through peer review, working the, through, through uh, with authors through revisions, to bound book, to marketing and publicity. And then of course I call on them to peer review my projects um, mm -hmm. and to uh, send new scholars my way. So that relationship that you have with an acquisitions editor really is a long-term relationship. And if you know someone who's published with a specific editor, call on them to help to, to call in some favors and to introduce you. That's a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, another good way is to look at different series that publishers are publishing in. Um, series are, are, are ways in which acquisitions editors partner with scholars in a specific field if they're interested in branching out in kind of new sub areas or, um, uh, or new trends in the discipline. And those series editors kind of act as ad hoc acquisitions editors in a way. Their, their job is really to, to keep their foot on the ground and, and bring people into the press who they think are doing exciting work. So reaching out to series editors with a project is a great way too, because they can kind of offer you that, that in that you might be looking for. Another thing to think about too is, is, is the cover letter uh, or the, the letter that you, the, the message that you send to an acquisitions editor that's, that's your first time of making contact. And really articulating in that message, why you're reaching out to that press and demonstrating that you've done kind of the legwork to, to show that you know what they're acquiring books in. Um, how do you see your book fitting in with that list? Um, what, um, what is it about the press that draws you to them? And, and that will really kind of indicate to an editor that, oh, this isn't just a, a pro forma, you're sending it off to a bunch of different publishers that you've really kind of done your work to, to um, to think through that process. In terms of uh, a proposal, the proposal itself is, um, is a genre unlike any other. And I'm sure, I'm sure Brandy could speak to that as well. Um, it really is a place where you have in a short amount of space, the opportunity to pitch your, it's a book pitch basically, to pitch your idea. 
um, to articulate why, um, why this book matters, who's going to read it, um, how it kind of stacks up in other books published in that area, um, and for you to kind of to provide that outline of what the book will um, what the book will contain. So, so several things to really think about are the the um, the first couple pages need to be all about your thesis statement and your argument. What is the unique material or the unique angle that you're bringing out with your project? Um, thinking about in that in that kind of thesis, what do you want your readers to walk away from your project with? What is the new kind of understanding we'll have by by reading through your work? Um, the other thing to think about is the audience. Uh, writing, like I said, most of you will be writing monographs for your first um, for your first book, and so I, I suggest you do not mention the the general audience that you're writing for, but really think mindfully about the disciplines that you're writing for. So most of you will be writing for scholars and students, but what kind of disciplines are you are you hoping to be interdisciplinary? Is your work meant to cross over and be read by multiple different kinds of scholars, and if so, who who are they? Um, and then finally, uh, the other thing to, to involve in there is, uh, along with the audience, is the market assessment. So listing about five different books that are already out in the market um, that have been published within the last three to five years that kind of either um, they complement the work that you're doing, your work is a corrective to, they um, they can compete in a certain way. So these books that kind of create an ecosystem around the work that you're doing uh, with a little paragraph about how what you're doing is different. And then finally, and I would say one of the, the longest parts of a proposal should be the um, annotated table of contents. So you'll look, you'll provide your table of contents and um, within each chapter title, uh, you'll provide a summary of what that chapter will contain, the argument, maybe your, your material that you'll be looking at, a case study or two that you'll be looking at. And it's important to show in that breakdown of chapters, how they all hang together. What is that connective tissue that brings them, um, that, that, that holds it, that makes it a complete whole? Um, editors are really looking for that arc for your argument to carry through and across your chapters. They really do not want them to be discrete, but to be um, to be part of a larger whole. So that's that's kind of a quick answer to what a proposal might contain. Right, right. Can we, so say we have a, a proposal that's been accepted now. Can we talk a little bit about the revision process? So what can an author expect out of an editing relationship with you? and? What's the, what does the time frame sort of look like from, you know, for the whole project, taking a dissertation mm -hmm. and getting a published book at the end? Right. right. Um, well, some, some editors, the first thing I would say is when you are um, seeking out and kind of shopping around to see what press is right for you, there's, there's some important question to, questions to ask during those meetings. And one of them is, is precisely, will you uh, consider a proposal and sample chapters for peer review, or do you want to wait for the complete manuscript? Um, some editors are very staunchly, I need to see the, first, the complete manuscript, and especially for first-time authors. Um, I, I consider projects for contract at proposal and sample chapter phases. Um, those two sample chapters in that proposal need to need to present a solid package of your work. Um, gone are the days where we can circulate things that are in draft form. They really need to be polished, and they need to be pieces of, of they need to be pieces of writing that will appear in the book themselves. So so avoid sending like a journal article, for example, that you might want to circulate in peer review. Um, the peer review process, of course, is what differentiates academic presses from commercial presses. And so that's a, a foundational uh, part of the process. And something that can be tricky, especially for younger scholars to navigate. Um, most of your books, you're so, you've, you're so close to the material, um, having worked through it in grad school, redeveloped it for the book, that the peer review process can sometimes be an awakening of sorts. Um, this is an opportunity for, uh, peers, of course, people in your field to comment on the content. This is what an editor, an editor really re relies on the peer review process to do that kind of deep dive into the content itself, to look at the rigor, look at the scholarship, 
um, look at the notes. Are you citing um, th the right people or are there people you're missing or things of this sort? Um, my job as an acquisitions editor, not only am I managing the peer review process, so kind of choosing, helping, uh, thinking through and choosing the, the, the kind of right people to get on board to provide that productive, critical feedback, um, but also to work with the author. I, I talk about it in terms of like expression. So you have, you're the expert on this topic and I'm not there to, to, to question the expertise necessarily or that deep content, but I'm there to really help authors express it in a way where they can reach their goal, their audience goal, right? So if you're right, we want people from a lot of different areas to be able to access your material. So what are those access points? Um, how do you make it legible? How do you um, get away from some of the, the thick jargon, um, the thick theory? How can we how can we kind of um, massage that to make it to make it readable? Uh, and so my job is more big picture stuff, looking at out looking at the the kind of structure, the organization, the packaging, things of that sort. Um, peer review for proposals and sample chapters, and again. This is all different under COVID, unfortunately, because we're all facing our own personal and professional challenges and time is, a pre is at a premium right now. But typically uh, peer review for proposals can take around, I would say on average about eight weeks time. And keeping in mind that the people that presses, uh, uh, and then let me, I'll back up. And then for manuscripts, it usually takes about 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. And so, um, thinking about that in terms of your timing and your time frame. Uh, but, but one thing to keep in mind about the peer review process is that peer reviewers have themselves been peer reviewed before, typically. And so peer reviewers, the peer review that you should receive should be constructive. It should, it should, be, it should offer you moments of enlightenment. Oh, I didn't think about that before. It could, it could help you think about how your work might be received if it is, if and when it is published in the public eye. So if there is critical feedback, it's important to take that seriously, not to get discouraged necessarily, but to think, oh, well, I need to anticipate that this actually might be feedback that I get when this goes out into the public record. And I need to address that up front and figure out ways to kind of navigate that. Um, and so, so the peer review process uh, is that kind of litmus test for your work. Once those peer review, re review reports come in, whether it's at the proposal or full manuscript stage, the author is expected to respond to those in an author response. Um, this document is a formal response. Um, I like to emphasize that. So, you know, writing, and again, this is kind of a genre unto itself, thanking the re peer reviewers, recognizing the good things they said about your project, and then addressing some of the critical um, if they had some critical or criticisms of your project, addressing those in a very professional way. Um, the, the peer review uh, documents, as well as the author response, come together to form a packet that presses will then circulate internally to their own um, staff members. This includes marketing and publicity. This includes other editors and directors and people of this sort. So it's a way to kind of, um, it, people that are will eventually kind of be on your book team. Um, so it's so it's uh, it's a packet of information that they will see, but also that faculty editorial boards will see. Um, almost every, I think every academic press has some sort of faculty editorial board um, that kind of serves as the arbiter of the imprint. Um, at UC Press, we have a very large one. It has 20 faculty members <laughs> that represent every UC campus and that represent every area that we acquire in. They too see those peer review reports and that author response. So the author response is not a place where you're, you're putting on your, your boxing mitts and, and duking it out. It's really a place where, where you um, recognize professionally that the places where you can improve or things that you just don't simply agree with. And this is why. Um, but at California, and I'm, I will end since we can move on to the next question, um, we may be heavy, a little top heavy in the, in the peer review, the kind of upfront peer review process. We have peer review at sample chapter proposal stage, peer review at full manuscript phase, and then the faculty editorial review. But once 
the final manuscript is submitted and is in-house with final art and all of these things, we're able to get books out in about eight months time. Um, and we use copy editors and typesetters who are all um, not in-house necessarily, but have been working with the press for years who know our systems really well. So we're able to kind of make that a seamless process. This is such a great advice and information for our audience. Um, I, we'll have time to, to, to talk more at the end. I think I'd like to bring in, bring in Brandy now to get at the author perspective, if that's okay. Yeah. So, so Brandy, um, so last November you published your first book, uh, Black in Place, The Spatial Aesthetics of Race in a Post-Chocolate City. And that was with the UNC Press. Um, so I guess I wanted to explore some of the similar questions that I asked Raina about process um, and, and bring in your experience uh, as, a, as a first time book author here. So let's take a look at some of the same things like the proposal, the review and the revisions. So first off, can you talk a bit about the proposal? How did this work for you? How did you approach potential publishers about your book? Thanks, Tim, and, and thank you for everyone who's joined. Um, so the process I took, so, so first of all, as we're thinking about, you know, the topic of the discussion today from the dissertation um, to publication, my dissertation, I did not publish it in full. Um, I actually only took half of it. And so um, because my dissertation was kind of two very distinct uh, topics clubbed together, I knew that I could probably eke two books out of it rather than trying to make it one. And so it was a matter of figuring out which book was going to be first. And it was the one that I felt had the most immediate need or that you know time would really affect how it would look um, if I didn't kind of address it first. And so, um, you know, in, in thinking about that urgency, uh, I started presenting information or presenting um, at conferences. And so I'm a trained sociologist. And so I started presenting um, at ASA and some other conferences that were um, related. And at the time I, you know, I was, let's see, I was a first year um, assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I wasn't thinking about a book. I was just trying to get settled um, into my new role uh, in the African-American studies department. And so as I'm doing these presentations, I actually started to um, get emails from um, acquisitions editors from different presses. And they were more so responding to the titles of my talks. And so that was when I started to realize how important it was to title your talk based on kind of the information that you're providing um, at the conference. And so there was one, um, um, editor from UNC Press who contacted me specifically about um, an, a, a chapter or at least a, a presentation that I was giving that was based on a chapter on the book that I decided to later write. Uh, and so at first, you know, I had talked to some of my mentors. I was still in very good touch, um, close touch with my mentors and advisors. And I had heard all of these things from, you know, recent grads in terms of you should rank, you know, the, the presses based on the field. And so in sociology, what are the top presses in sociology? There were others who said, look at your bookcase and who, what, what are the books or at least the presses from which the books you read the most or your favorite books, where do they come from? And so, you know, I kind of ignored both of those <laughs> things um, primarily because fit mattered to me. Um, so a lot of what Raina was saying, I think is really important. It wasn't just about, you know, who was the best or, you know, who was the loudest. Um, it was more so in terms of who really got what I was trying to do. And so at the time, um, this editor, he seemed really interested. And so I think like we exchanged a couple of emails, but then he disappeared. And so I didn't know what happened. And so at the time I was like, well, maybe I ought to start thinking about this book. I was fortunate um, to be part of a group of first year and second year um, assistant professors, and we formed the first book club. And what we started to do was meet bi-weekly and essentially um, start crafting our book proposals and discussing the presses that we wanted to approach or were hoping um, approached us. And so what we also did, there was someone who organized it. The organizer started reaching out to acquisitions editors at the presses that we were interested in and asked them to Skype in and talk to us about the process, what types of books they were looking for. And to be honest with you, like there, there were some editors I did not like, like their personalities. <laughs> 
were not great and generous. And it seemed as though, you know, th there were presses that expected you to be interested in them, but they had to decide whether they were interested in you as a writer. And that was not the type of environment I really wanted to be a part of. And some of them were the top, you know, presses. And so from that, I learned a lot about how different editors work with um, authors, how the press works with authors generally, and then which ones were interested in having this long-term relationship where you end up publishing more than one book with them. And so from that process, we started writing together. Um, and so those elements that Raina mentioned were those that I included um, in terms of thinking about audience, thinking about market. And that's when I started to realize it's a business. Like, so as much as I wanted to certainly get a particular viewpoint out there, I also knew that they had to sell my book. And so there had to be ways that I was comparing it to what was already out there in the market and then what I could add, what value I could add. Um, and so that meant, you know, is this a book for undergrads or is it for graduate students? Is this a book that, you know, various practitioners could be interested in? Uh, and so for me, it was something that I honestly didn't expect to have um, the impact it did outside of my field. And so when I wrote the proposal, I didn't have in mind that urban planners or architects or others might be interested. I was hopeful, but I couldn't necessarily point to work that I felt was similar um, to mine or at least the one I was going to produce. So in, in my case, I was also very explicit about the fact that I didn't have a full book. I had two chapters, barely. And though I had worked on those two chapters, I didn't have a book. I had an idea of a book. So what that meant was in terms of my timeline, I had to decide when do I want this book to be published, how it related to tenure, like all of those different considerations that I had to really plot out um, and then how much I could get done while teaching a couple of classes per semester. And so I really was pretty strategic and, and pragmatic about that decision. And so I knew, for example, I wasn't going with Duke because they wanted a whole manuscript. And so I was like, that's not happening. And they have a process where they will do that peer review the first time you hand it and then they'll do it again. And so for me, that extended the time way too long. At the same time, I did meet with an editor from Duke because I just happened to be um, in North Carolina one time for an, a, a fellowship that I had. And I wrote him up and said, hey, I have lunch. Are you around? And we had lunch. So I got a better perspective on like the process with that particular press. But I still had the guy from UNC in the back of my mind. It's just, I, I lost him. So um, then after a while, I started to think about not only fit, but also what presses could hold the very interdisciplinary um, project that I was doing. And so I was looking at University of Minnesota, particularly in their urban studies and architecture um, acquisitions editor, but then I still had UNC in mind. So finally, I was, I got, um, an email from a new editor who took over the old acquisitions editor. I come to find out he had left the uh, press and this new editor was taking over. And so he said, I don't know if you already have signed with someone, but I'm still interested in your work. So, hey, let's chat. And so after talking to him, I felt a lot more comfortable about the commitment. And to be honest with you, a lot of it, you know, I, I was debating whether I wanted to go with a press that I thought, okay, it has prominence. And again, the same question that I asked before, does it has prominence? I've, I've seen a lot of great books that come from it. Or do I kind of want to go with love and like support and someone who's going to really try to see my project all the way through. So I went with the latter. Um, and as it related to um, UNC's typical book, UNC was really strong in history. And there were a ton of historians who were just like foaming at the mouth to get a, um, a UNC press because of their, because they were historians. I'm a sociologist and I was kind of dabbling in geography, anthropology, like urban studies, a variety of things. And they weren't necessarily known for that. And so the one thing I knew about myself was I'm not actually the type of person who needs to enter a space where there's already a foundation that's already set. I'm more the opposite that I'll enter a space and try to actually build um, and transform a space. And so it didn't scare me that they weren't known for that type of work, but instead it might actually be a starting point um, that they could start attracting more work like mine and then kind of move through it. So as I started working with um, my editor, I, I had to supply them with um, a uh, proposal and the two chapters. 
um, and with the proposal, oh, the cover letter, of course, um, that also kind of detailed um, the elements. And so I handed that in to Lucas and he basically was like, we can get you an advanced contract um, based on them sending out the chapters and the proposal. And I got wonderful feedback um, from the two uh, reviewers that he sent it to. Um, and you know, it's blind, right? It's a blind process. So you don't know who's reviewing it. You don't know from what di discipline. And so reading it, I could actually tell that one was a sociologist, one was a geographer based on the feedback that they gave, right? I can even kind of tell gender too. It's interesting how you can tell that. Uh -huh. um, but so through the um, responses that I received, I was able to craft, well, first I got the advanced contract from UNC. Um, and so there wasn't really kind of a, a period of negotiation because what I'll also tell you is, you know, I, I, this I'm a first time author and I'm also first generation in terms of undergrad, grad, beyond. So I actually didn't know a lot of the process. I didn't know that, you know, you could negotiate around copy fees, right? So the copywriting around proofreading, those types with the galleys, I didn't know any of that. So I'm just kind of going along with whatever is on there as long as the contract looked okay. I was fortunate in that my institution provide, I, I was able to apply for funds through my institution so I didn't have to pay for it out of pocket. But again, still thinking about these elements, um, it was really important for me to start to establish a community of people who were going through that same process. So that's where the um, first book club, our first book group was really instrumental um, in really moving that forward. And I was one of the first people that got um, a contract out of the group. So I was able to kind of give them guidance and, and share my experiences with them. Um, okay, I don't know if I'm going over the question or if I'm like <laughs> answering no, more than you asked. <laughs> no, that's super, that's super terrific. Um, well, one thing I wanted to ask you, so you you took two chapters from your dissertation and that yeah. was your first book. Um, you know, something that we think about a lot from a scholarly communication standpoint, and you mentioned it, you know, briefly is we try to help prepare students so they can retain the rights that they need to publish their work, um, especially from a sort of copyright perspective. Did you encounter any problems there, either in including content mm -hmm. into the book um, that you'd written, um, but also things like images and clearing mm -hmm. rights for that? I didn't encounter any issues. Um, we, we were able to establish up, up front for those um, elements that I had published and, and one chapter in particular that I ended up breaking up for the book, there were elements that were in an edited volume. And so it was just a matter of getting um, permission from Rutledge, you know, in terms and, and putting that important language of pieces of this or some of this material is in this book and citing that. And it was pretty clear and it's actually at the beginning of the book. Um, in terms of images, um, that was another area where I was fortunate, where I have a lot of friends who are artists and I asked them to go take pictures for me. And so they ended up doing it. Um, and then also it's kind of like the press didn't have a ton of money to um, pay for images. And so luckily because the friends discount, they didn't really make me pay a lot of money or at least make the press pay a lot of money for the images or the production of maps, et cetera. And so there were some, however, where I did have to, um, seek permission, I had to solicit images that I had seen. Uh, and I ended up applying for funds to pay for those because they were more expensive. There was a time though, there were some Im two images in particular that I wanted to reprint from the Washingtonian magazine. And that was pretty much impossible. Like they couldn't hmm. find the original um, photographer, then, you know, they lost the correspondence. And so after a while, I just let it go. So it would have, it was a, it would have been a nice to have, um, but it didn't end up happening and it ended up being okay. I gave a clear description of it and it didn't um, make or break the chapter, but you know, it was fine. Okay. Well, before we bring Rachel in, um, do you have any, like what advice would you give to students now as they're preparing their dissertations to help sort of set them on the right path, you know, to publishing a book? Do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I, you know, I had gotten, you know, some of those books that talk about transitioning your dissertation into a book. And, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, I think they probably work for some people. It, it didn't work for me. I think it depends on the discipline. Some people prepare their dissertations as articles. So it might be separate articles, each one. Um, others are given the advice to 
think about a book as they're writing their dissertation. I think the issue with that is oftentimes, especially in those first couple of chapters, you're really speaking to literature. And so I didn't want to write a book where I had to devote a full chapter to talking to other scholars. Um, I wanted, it, it, you, you have a different voice in your dissertation than you do in your book. And so I think there was too much of my voice, or at least establishing my voice in my dissertation or trying to fit into a field in my dissertation than it was in the book where I'm trying to assert that I am an expert in this area um, and that I've done this research and that empirically it's strong and I can still kind of contend with what's going on kind of again in multiple multiple fields. So if anything, I think, you know, time actually helps. So there might be this rush to, you know, go, go, go. Um, and think about transitioning it immediately. But I'll be honest that even though, you know, I started with two chapters and expanded it to five, that it was really important for me to take time and start to develop other areas that I wouldn't have done previously. Or to have like, for example, you know, I attended this conference, this architecture conference that blew my mind and it shifted how I really engaged space. And so spa like space is a huge kind of deal in my book. And so had I not gone to that conference, I don't know that the book would look the way it does now. And so I needed that experience um, and, and also the opportunity to teach some of the material to my students in order to really come up with stronger arguments and to look for um, other forms of evidence. My research questions shifted um, from the dissertation to the book as well. And so so again, with time, I was able to um, really kind of marinate and figure out what would work best for the book. And, and also in that case, I'd say, and especially like what Raina was talking about, how UC Press um, takes on, you know, a couple of chapters versus the whole manuscript that that time between you know handing in the two chapters and then having to produce a full draft allowed me to really kind of rethink and retool what was going on so i i i would encourage people to not rush and to really take the time to be thoughtful um, and to really take the time to get some confidence in your voice because there's a way that um PhD programs can be destabilizing and can also really shake your confidence. And when you're preparing a monograph, you you, you need that confidence. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's just gonna take some time and energy and, and grace, give yourself some grace in order to produce that wonderful product. Fantastic, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's pivot a bit, let's bring Rachel in from Authors Alliance. Um, you know, Rachel, we know that managing copyright is is a crucial consideration during this entire process. So could you talk a little bit about um, why is copyright such a key aspect of, of publishing in the first place and why should we as authors care about it? Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you, Tim, and thank you everyone for your time. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so as Tim, as you said, copyright is totally crucial um, to the book process, or book publishing process. Um, one main reason is it's really closely linked to ownership and authorship. So the way copyright works is as soon as you take pen to paper and create original creative expression, um, you have a copyright in that work. The same is true if you type and save it on your computer as is probably more likely the case these days. Um, so because you have that copyright, as soon as you write anything down, your publisher needs your permission in order to do anything with the work, including publish it. Um, so essentially copyright is about who can control the work, um, who gets to say what happens with it. And you know, both the author and the publisher are intimately involved in that process. Um, and in fact, copyright is actually a property right. So it's about, I mean, who owns the work? Um, and not only that, but when we talk about copyright, we sort of, um, it could sound kind of monolithic, but copyright is really a bundle of different rights. It's an umbrella of different things that um, one can do with the work. So the right to publish it, uh, distribute, display, and create derivative works. Um, so copyright law provides clarity on how all of these rights are split up. And importantly, it also keeps others from exercising rights without authorization, um, unless that use falls into one of the exceptions to copyright, um, like fair use, which we'll probably get to in a little while. 
Um, moreover, it's important to keep in mind that copyright lasts for a really long time. Um, under current copyright law for works created after 1978, it lasts for the full life of the author plus an additional 70 years. Um, finally, copyright matters a lot for the market for a book. Um, a publisher often will want exclusive publication rights in order to invest in that work and expect a return on that investment. Um, because we can sue for copyright infringement, the publisher can have that expectation of a return on their investment and um, you know, safely invest in new books and helping bring new authors' works into the world. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, publishing contracts. So we know that there can be a lot of different sections in the publication contracts. And this can be a little bit daunting, you know, to a new author who might not have encountered these these negoti these contracts before. So I'm wondering, can you walk us through some of the important sort of rights related sections that you might see in a typical book publication contracts? And you know, what sort of issues should authors be aware about? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so the grant of rights section is one of the most important for these purposes, um, because as I said, you hold the copyright in a work simply by writing it. Your publisher needs permission to do anything with it, uh, to publish it in the first place. And this is handled typically in the grant of rights. So the grant of rights clause will lay out what rights you're giving the publisher to use in your work and on what terms. This encompasses both the various rights under copyright that I discussed a little uh, earlier, like publishing it, performing it, displaying it, but it also encompasses what the publisher plans to do with your work. Um, so what formats they're authorized to produce it in, where they're authorized to distribute it. Um, and all of these are of really big consequence. When we at Authors Alliance talk about publishing contracts, we like to use the acrostic runs. Um, so the contract runs your relationship with the publisher. So you should be sure to read, understand, negotiate, and save it. Um, <laughs> it's a little silly, but it it's really like important. It. Um, <laughs> uh, other rights related things you should be on the lookout for are um, your obligations with respect to the manuscript. So this will include the sort of non-legal stuff like topic and word count, um, but also your promises with respect to the content of the work so that it doesn't infringe on anyone else's copyrights. It's not defamatory, it's accurate. Um, and then furthermore, your, your publisher has obligations as well. So that's another, that will be another rights related section. Um, finally, financial considerations are, for, I mean, for all authors and publishers, extremely important within the contract, um, terms that govern whether you're getting an advance, how royalties will be calculated, how accounting will work. Um, and finally, there is going to be a set of terms that govern what governs what happens when you part ways. So what happens to the rights, um, the, the copyright and et cetera. Um, if the book isn't selling copies, if your publisher is acquired, um, I don't know, does that answer your question? Did I miss yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, to build on that last part, another thing I wanted to ask about, I know Authors Alliance has a lot of good educational materials, and I know one of the, the informational booklets that you've created is um, on options that authors have to get their rights back from a publisher. So can you talk a little bit about this rights reversion process, why authors might want to pursue it, and sort of how it works within a book contract? Sure, sure. Um, so typically, an author wants to get their to acqu acquire a version of rights, get their rights back, um, because the work is either out of print or not really selling, and the author would like to make their book of, book available again to readers. Um, this is something that's really near and dear to our mission at Authors Alliance, since we represent um, authors who write to be read. So whether you can exercise a right of reversion depends almost entirely on the language of the contract. Um, it's a contractual right established within the contract itself that allows you to formally reclaim the rights that were um, previously assigned or licensed to your publisher. So a typical rights reversion clause has a condition which when that condition occurs, it triggers the author's ability to request a reversion of rights. 
Um, often this is the book being out of print or sales falling below a certain threshold. Um, and I'll, I'll mention here that with the rise of eBooks and print on demand technology, rights reversion clauses have become a little bit more tricky. So one common condition for, um, one common triggering condition for in a rights reversion clause is the book being out of print. But in print might be defined really broadly. Um, and with the rise of eBooks and print on demand technology, publishers can more easily uh, make a book available in some way without investing the same resources that were required in the past um, when a publisher would have to issue a new print run, for example. So um, in negotiating publication contracts, it's important to consider that. And um, we would suggest negotiating for a rights reversion clause defining in print a bit more narrowly if you are granting your publisher the right to publish as an ebook or print on demand. So the way this works, um, you make a formal request to the publisher, um, be prepared for some back and forth and possibly even a bit of resistance if your book is still selling. Um, so you make this formal request, your publisher will have a set amount of time to respond. Um, they may be given the opportunity to cure the triggering event and reissue your book. Um, but once rights, if and when rights revert to the author, they're free to do anything they wish with them. A lot of authors have found success um, making their book freely available under Creative Commons or similar license, pursuing open access publishing. Um, and some authors have even found a new publisher that would like to re reissue their work um, and give it new life. Oh, I'll, I'll add, uh, you mentioned Authors Alliance resources. We have a guide to rights reversion that goes into these issues in a lot more depth um, among our other publication related guides. So if you go to our website, authorsalliance.org slash issues, um, you can see these and I highly recommend it. I, there's much more there than I could ever cover in a few minutes here. Excellent. Uh, I have one more question before we sort of open it up to the audience. Um, wanted to get your thoughts a bit on what authors should know about with regard to third party rights. So, you know, of course, when we create scholarship, we're building on what came before, you know, and we incorporate text or images from other people. Can you give us a sense of some of the considerations that authors might need to think about in negotiations with their publishers in securing these rights for say images or, or third party content of their books and sort of like, how does that, how does that work? I mean, a big question that you should consider in contract negotiations is who bears the responsibility for acquiring and paying for third party permission rights. Um, third party, per Yes, third party permission rights refer to things you want to include um, that where their rights are held by someone else are held by someone else. So um, sometimes publishers assist authors in obtaining the necessary permissions, um, but it's still pretty common for the ultimate burden to be placed on the author, which can be, I mean, quite burdensome. Um, it's a it's a complicated process. It can be hard to find rights holders. I mean, Brandy's example is, I think, a, a really classic one and can leave authors in a lurch if there's something that they'd really like to include. Um, another consideration is fair use. So in some circumstances, authors um, or anyone can use reasonable portions of another's work for certain purposes without payment um, or permission. It's, it's kind of a fact specific inquiry and I don't have time to get into it here, yeah. um, but if you do plan to rely on fair use, it's a good idea to try to include that in, your, in the permissions clause in your contract um, that it allows you to rely on fair use where applicable. And then I'd also suggest um, just asking your publisher for help if you need it. Um, they may be willing to supply you with sort of permission forms you can send to the rights holder to make things easier for you. They may have guidance on finding rights holders that are difficult to track down. Um, and you may be able to negotiate with the publisher for them to pay for the permission fees if you're willing to make concessions elsewhere. Um, so it's one piece of many in the negotiation process, but it's really important to be aware of the financial considerations there um, because fees, I think especially for images can be like really, really high. Fantastic, thank you so much for walking us through that. Yeah, thank um, you. Well, let's, let's bring in some questions from the chat and the audience now. Um, Rachel Sandberg, maybe you can help us steer, steer us through here. 
I will. I love steering. Um, okay. I, I think I'm going to kind of break these up by who I think they're directed to, but once that person answers, please, the rest of you feel free to, to jump in and add additional um, insights. So um, uh, starting with uh, Raina, what's the ideal length of an academic book in terms of word count and each chapter? I would say number one, trying to get that balance across chapters is um, is something to really shoot for. So not having one that's a little like that's too unwieldy and one that's really short. Um, just being really in showing showing intentionality, I think, around um, the structure and the framework of your book is important. In terms of length, it's really subject specific. So. I kind of say the sweet spot is around 90,000 words and that's inclusive of notes and bibliography. That will generate like a six by nine book of around 230, 250 pages. We're seeing a lot, maybe a little bit longer. We're seeing a lot of shorter books these days, kind of closer to 70 and 80,000, kind of short pithy um, interrogations into certain subjects. And those, those are also quite nice. Um, and I think for readers, they kind of provide this kind of um, uh, a little bit of a breath of fresh air. Now in history, of course, and I do publish in film history, these his historians really do like to go on and on. They're bringing together all these stories from the archives and you do have a, a bit of leeway there. I would say 120,000, 100,000, 120,000 is pretty typical for those historical books. Um, anything above that, be prepared to qualify. I mean, that's going to cost resources and time for copy editing and for and and cost of goods for printing and all of that. So um, I think the shorter, the better. OK, great. Um, and this is a, a transition question to for um, Raina into Brandy. So either of you feel free to, to jump in with it. Um, but what, what do you wish that PhD students or, or graduates knew um, about what this process was going to be like for them? What's lacking in kind of current instruction or education? For example, Brandy, you mentioned once you were a faculty member, you formed a writing group. But wouldn't that have been amazing if, um, you know, along the way there there had been some kind of support? So, based on either of what you are seeing, what would you what's missing from, um, and what could Berkeley do better? You go ahead, Brandy. But I do have some some thoughts as well. <laughs> um, I, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I I think there's. I, I think that first time authors should really recognize that they have to advocate for themselves. And so, um, you know, there's a way in which we've worked with a committee or worked with senior scholars who have given us advice and encouraged us to make certain decisions. But when it comes to your book, you have to sometimes like beyond negotiation um, as it relates to the contract, there was a point at which, um, you know, so I had I had a friend who also was with UNC Press, and it seems as though her process was really smooth. And so I assumed that the processes looked the same. We had the same editor. You know, it looked as though it should have been the same. There was a distinction though, because her book. So in terms of thinking about length, her book her book was a little shorter than mine. And on top of that, um, why they why it went quicker is because it also seemed to be for an a broader audience than mine, right? So they were both monographs. They were both um, they both had this academic um, audience that they were targeting. But mine, as my um, reviewer said, was more targeted towards like a graduate <laughs> audience, uh, graduate students, and probably faculty more so than it was for undergraduates at a at general audience. And so as it related to going to the board and the editorial board and also kind of going through reviews, they had to make sure some of the complex kind of theoretical elements I was adding would make sense and would potentially sell the book, right? And so there was some feedback, for example, on how I define terms 
or whether I was expansive enough um, in terms of how I, I was identifying terms. And to be honest with you, I was like, no, this is really how I want it. Like, I don't want to change it. This is exactly how I want it. I can explain to you why I did this, um, but I'm not taking it out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it the way it is. And so I think, you know, in graduate school, I wouldn't have necessarily taken that position. But what I had learned is that I'm shopping as much as they are. So I have power too. And I don't think that first time authors often know that it's more so you have to gussy yourself up to be picked by a, a press and, and it doesn't have to be like that. You have power, you have the, you have the book, you have the idea and you want them to be as excited about you as you are about them. So I think it's, it still goes back to that confidence and time and experience to really build that up and enable you to know how you can advocate for yourself. They can speak to you about marketing in terms of the experience of getting out there, selling the book, you know, um, the publicist is your best friend, you know, just really kind of determining which um, fields or, or, or which areas you need to really kind of focus on. But in terms of the work itself, you are the expert. And I think it's hard sometimes to really hold on to that fact when you want to get something out there that's popular. And then I'll just, I'll just add, add real fast. Um, I would say um, just re-emphasizing, I think what Brandy had said earlier, that that time is really needed between the completion of the dissertation and writing that first book, because the dissertation itself is an exercise in genre unto its own. I mean, it's written under extreme duress, under very different circumstances that a book should be written under. Um, so when that dissertation is done, tuck it away, think about how you can get the most mileage out of that, those pieces of writing that you've done. That time in between the dissertation and the book is really where you need to go out and establish yourself as the expert. So go to conferences, get on panels, talk about, talk about the book that you want to write and start using those moments to formulate what that's gonna look like. What can you take from the dissertation and expand upon to make it into a, co a, co a cohesive book project? publish articles, you know, do these kinds of things that put you out into the public and to your scholarly public to establish your expertise. And then the book will not only um, come a little bit more naturally, but it will also have a ready and waiting audience. It's waiting for you to talk more about the stuff that you've brought to their attention. And one last thing, write the book and treat the book project as, um, and write it to become the scholar you wanna be in about five years because it's going to take a while to get it actually out into the world. But if you go into that book project already fatigued with your subject, already like, oh, I just want to get tenure and move on with my life, that's not a great productive way. I, I can tell you your book will probably die on the vine. Um, writing to be read and writing to be the expert in a field that you can then carry on into your career um, publishers will really want to collaborate with you and, ex and expect you to kind of peddle your wares in a way once the book is done. You, you are your best kind of publicist. You know who your readers are. And so um, making sure that that enthusiasm and interest in your subject is sustainable, I think, um, is another thing I would suggest. Thank you so much. Brandy, um, we're officially transitioning to you now. So uh, there was a question about how long did it take you to complete the three additional chapters while also teaching and doing everything else you were doing? <laughs> right, right. Um, how long did it take? So let's see. Like I, you know, so how I can chart it is I have how many versions of my book proposal. Like I keep everything, by the way. Like ev I keep everything, every draft of everything I keep. Um, and so for the for the three chapters, I'll say that I, like I said, I had the two two chapters that I've been working on um, that were from my dissertation, and they weren't the chapters in my dissertation. I want to be clear about that. I had two chapters, but they didn't reflect the work that I did in grad school. So it was kind of like I took parts of what was in my dissertation. Like for example, my fifth chapter is from maybe like four paragraphs uh, from my dissertation and I just expanded it into a full chapter. And so um, to write the three chapters, it took a few months. I'm trying to think. I handed in the first draft in December of 2017. So it took about eight months 
um, to write the three chapters. And that was, I mean, like you said, like I said, and like you said, Rachel, it was after I was teaching, I had a ton of too much service and uh, I was commuting. So it was a lot. And it also, I'd also, if you don't have a writing practice, I suggest you get one now. Um, and that writing practice had to be different than when I was in graduate school. Um, by then I had a child, I had a job, I had all these other things going on. And so I had to find moments in the day, which was really typically 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. to write. Um, and that was all I had. So I was very discreet in the fact that I had two hours a day to get something done. And, and that was it. And it took about eight months. And just to add one little bit more to that, you had also said that you um, kind of worked, workshopped in some ways, some of the material with students or at conferences. So what mm -hmm. was that period of time as well? So, so some of that was from those first two chapters that I had worked on to get to um, the advanced contract. And so I didn't workshop as much with those last three because it was just a hustle. Like I was just getting it out. By then I had the responses from those two reviewers in terms of how I should focus the manuscript. And they really didn't have comments in terms of me changing anything. It was more so, hey, had you thought about this, this theorist? I don't, I didn't see it in your proposal, blah, blah, blah. So it was, I was pretty much holding on to the same structure that I provided the press. Um, it was just more so, like I said, enhancement. Um, but in, in class, for example, like when I was teaching, you know, a lot of it had to do with images. I work really well with images. And so it's throwing out um, images and kind of speaking to the students as if I was arguing in my book. And so it's usually there would be, you know, one class period where I decide to use an image that I wanted to use in the book mm -hmm. and kind of talk through it and, and make that particular argument in class. Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to Rachel, um, but I think in a strange perfect circle, some of these questions might also be answered by Raina. Um, so Rachel, um, when do authors need to start negotiating their book contract? Um, when does it need to be finalized before moving on in the in the publishing process? And again, Rena, feel free to, to kind of jump in here too. Uh, yeah, I actually think Rena will probably have a more solid answer okay. than I do on that. Um, but I think in practice often um, there's, an agreement in principle before a contract is fully uh, negotiated and signed. Legally speaking, um, you should have a contract signed before you rely on that deal. Um, but I think probably the practices of sort of the interactions between the editors and the rights people, um, it probably varies a lot. I don't know, Raina, do you wanna say anything else? Does that sound right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that sounds right. The um... There, the, the things that I that are I think immediate concern in terms of um, in terms of laying sketching out that kind of the next steps between the relationship between the author and the editor is is the schedule and so like walking into the negotiations being very clear about the status of your work about how much time you think you're going to need to complete it um, and and being very reasonable about that and not thinking too ambitiously. Um, being very clear, having clear conversations about what, what the expectations are around um, images and illustrations, how that's quantified, um, how the permissions process works, um, and having those conversations before I think even a contract is issued is, um, is really helpful because that will, that will go into how you envision your own project. Um, and at the end of the day, you want, you and your editor want to shape share the same vision of the work going forward because your editor will be your advocate for you throughout the life of the book at the press. Thank you. Um, Rachel, there was also a question about sort of the division of rights. So it, if it's possible um, in the grant of rights section to give a, a publisher first publication rights, but say retain translation or film or other various kinds of adaptation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm glad I'm glad someone asked because it's a really important point. Um, the grant of rights section provides a lot of flexibility to carve up rights in different ways. Um, so this can range from all rights under copyright for the duration of copyright, which is sort of the extreme version, um, to a license for English language rights in North America paperback five years. 
Um, I think usually it probably falls somewhere in the middle. Um, and then the other thing is, so that, that can be done in the grant of rights. I think um, publishers and authors come to different arrangements to um, both meet their goals. You know, from a publisher's perspective, um, they, they wanna be able to make a profit from the book. They're excited about it. Um, but I think there is room to compromise and increasingly there are different arrangements authors and publishers can come, uh, can come to. So authors, I think often, I'm sorry, often um, authors will have other opportunities to use rights. So that, that can be a real advantage. Movie rights for some projects is uh, I think a good example. Um, and I will add outside of the grant of rights clause, it can be a good idea to include an all rights reserved clause as sort of like a catch all. Um, this, this can work to your advantage if something is left out of the grant of rights or if there's sort of a totally new use of your work that emerges in the future. Um, yeah, so it, there's, there's a lot there, but definitely it's Which the grant mean of that rights. that the author retains anything that's not expressly granted to the publisher. Exactly, exactly, um, yes. Um, and then one more question around um, kind of legal legal issues, and I and I think any of you could answer this really is, what kind of support um, might a publisher provide to an author around kind of the ancillary? Um, I don't know if it's distractions or harassment that could happen from, um, you know, someone mentioned doxing or harassment from right wing organizations. Is there anything in the relationship, but whether it's with embodied within the publishing contract or otherwise within the relationship with the publisher that would provide some support to the author um, for exposure to, to those things? I don't, I don't know of anything in a contract that does that. Um, my guess is that would be something more within the long-term relationships that really drive the work's success. Um, but I would be very curious to hear if that's something that is being included in publishing contracts. Um, yeah, it, that's a really tough question. It's, it's like a new horrible thing. Um, and I hope that I hope that something's. I hope that something's being done um, to work together to protect authors when that kind of thing happens. Yeah, I don't. I saw that question come up, and I, you know, I don't know of anything that um, that presses can legally do to support the author necessarily, but the work itself is certainly something that the the press protects. Um, and so uh, there's clauses in there. Um, warranty indemnities and all of these things about about the content of the book so if the if the if if the um you know as long as the the i's were dotted and the t's were crossed in terms of getting for example like subject permission forms for your interviews and things of this sort the press will go to the mat because that was you know this was we did our job the author did their job the press did their job whether it was due diligence or certainly getting the form signed. I mean, those kinds of things we we protect the work over. So I think the contract is more about the work rather than the author necessarily. Um, but but it is a new a new day where, you know, that seems to be more present, unfortunately. Rena, while I have you, um, something that we, we get asked every year is should students embargo their dissertations in order to um, preserve the possibility of being uh, uh, approached or approachable to a, a, a press? Frankly, I think it's neither here nor there for me, at least for me and my colleagues that I've not just at my press, but at other presses where I've worked or my colleagues across presses. I, and this is why, I mean, the, again, the book project, being prepared for the fact that the book project is going to look drastically different than the dissertation. Um, and, and that, and, and that it should really be a very different kind of document, a very different kind of document of record even. And just some, you know, just some pointers when you are sending out your proposal, which should come with a CV um, in that packet of material, be very careful about how you title your book project and, and so that it does not mirror exactly your dissertation <laughs> title. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's uh, very, that seems very intuitive and simple, but too often I think um, 
authors are too quick to the punch and just really want to get their work out. They're not thinking about the packaging and, and all of that. So um, I don't think that there's a problem with the embargo or no embargo. Um, and, I, and, and that's why they're two very different pieces of work. Brandy, I'm wondering if your dissertation was published open access before um, and whether this came up for you at all. It, it wasn't and it didn't. Um, yeah, no, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> we get asked this all the time because um, of the UC's, uh, well, of UC Berkeley's open access policy with right. dissertations and Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's always helpful to have a publisher's perspective sure. as well, too. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this question from Caitlin, um, because I, I feel like either Raina or Brandy, this might be for either of you. Um, so Caitlin writes that she has colleagues who have successfully published their books in two different ways. One immediately submitted their book proposal before editing their manuscript. Another uh, made months of thorough manuscript revisions before submitting the book proposal. Um, any thoughts on the best approach? Also, is it necessary to have a book manuscript workshop? You want to go, Rena? <laughs> sure. Um, I, you know, I think I am a big advocate for taking the time to to really uh, develop and shape the take from the dissertation those bits and pieces that will go into the book. So I'm more of a proponent of that. Um, I think it benefits you more in the long run um, because you're taking that time up front to really think through what your next steps are. And I think for a first book author, coming to an editor with that confidence that you know that, um, or you can speak to uh, what the end product is gonna look like will, uh, will go, I think, a, a very long way. Um, and that, that proposal genre is really, it, 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 I think this depends on, on editors as well, but it's, it's very, it, it's a particular kind of, um, document that, that does function as a, I, at least at UC Press, we take the, the proposal very seriously because that is your vision of what you want the book to be. And that's how you sell that's how you sell the project to the editor and the editor sells the, pro the project to their colleagues and to the peer reviewers. And so that proposal really needs to be well thought through, so. I'm in agreement um, just in terms of not only my experience, but, but the experiences of, of my peers and, and some of my friends. And, and again, like I said, you know, I, I mean, and, and Raina actually mentioned this too, the conditions under which you produce a dissertation should be different um, than those that you're encountering when you're writing a book. And so even though people do receive, you know, advice in terms of how to write the dissertation in order to prepare for the book, the time really is invaluable. I, I can't stress that enough. And then also, you know, I was a I was the type of graduate student who didn't feel comfortable sharing my work with other people. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, I got to that late. Uh, and so once I graduated, I started becoming a lot more comfortable sharing. And so there were multiple drafts um, of not only my book proposal, but also kind of thinking through the chapters that I needed. And so if there's an opportunity for a workshop, I think it's good also because if you have people in the room or in the Zoom um, who are from different disciplines, you want it to be legible to other fields as well. And so if you're used to only interacting with people in your field, then again, this is a product that's supposed to sell widely, hopefully, right? And so you want it to be, um, like I said, legible to other people um, at different stages. And so sometimes that requires various sets of eyes um, and perspective in order to, to really kind of uh, create a, a functional document. So, I mean, wonderful um, for your friend uh, because that can cut down on time, perhaps, because sometimes it's actually not a quicker process. Um, because the more, um, the tighter the documents can be, sometimes, you know, the process goes a lot quicker, but that could have been with a much longer kind of pre-process versus, you know, handing something and immediately and kind of moving on from there. Um, for all of the, the students and researchers, have I missed anything that you want to ask any of our panelists? 
Okay, great. I'm going to give everyone, um, our, our panelists, one last piece of uh, advice if, if they want to take it. Um, and I would also like to add one of my own, even though I'm not a panelist, um, in response to something that Brandy said that should never happen in the world. Um, so I'll go last. Um, Rachel, I, I'll, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, my, my last piece of advice that's short is negotiation is just a conversation. Um, what what Brandy was saying about her contract with, you know, not knowing where and how to negotiate, it's really, really common. And I think a publishing contract can be so intimidating, um, but it's a good opportunity to like read through it, try to understand it and don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Um, a publisher is a publisher may be more likely to make concessions if you're prepared to explain that if you really care about an affordable price point um, or retaining a certain right it's it's good to ask for that more likely than not nothing bad is going to happen from asking um, and yeah negotiation is not as scary as it seems um, and you should approach it as such great thanks Rena. your parting thought I would say one other thing to do between the time of your completing the dissertation and writing that first book is just read and read and read and read some more. There's um, there's no reason necessarily to reinvent the wheel. And so if you have books out there where you admire the narrative and the prose or the approach and the methodology or the structure and the framework, find ways in which you can you can implement implement that in your own writing and practice. Thank you. And Brandy? And my cat. <laughs> I, I'd say, um, you know, I agree with what both of our panelists um, have said. And also, I, I wanted to add that there is an opportunity to really tap into your creativity with the book. Um, and also, again, to um, break down some of the boundaries that you might have had to erect when writing um, the dissertation. And so I think methodologically, I was a little bit more experimental with the book than I certainly was um, with the dissertation. And what I'm finding, especially when I you know, give guest lectures or give talks, um, book talks, that I have graduate students who are most attracted to my methods because I decide to do something different. And so don't feel, again, kind of blocked or, or um, like you have kind of uh, some types of boundaries that will carry on um, past your graduate school experience. So really, I mean, it, it's really a function of seeing yourself as a writer now, um, not just a researcher. And being a writer is a different muscle. And also it kind of, again, relies on you tapping into that creativity that I promise you have that you might have felt like you exhausted <laughs> through graduate school, but you can bring it back and you can really kind of show the world what kind of work you can really do. That's really wonderful. Um, and now the thing I have to say is so mundane in comparison. Um, it, it's just that what happened to you, Brandy, with um, not being able to clear the Washingtonian rights should never happen because um, publishers should not be so risk averse that they couldn't rely on fair use or the, at a minimum, the um, unlikelihood that any rights holder would ever take action against the use of that content. So um, I, I, we need to get to a universe where um, publishers can uh, take on a little more comfort with fair use or at least um, be less risk averse because content should never suffer for that. And I'm sorry that's not nearly as poetic as everything that, that Brandy just inspired you all to, to do about being a writer. But um, from, I know, I think Rachel would agree too, from a content perspective, um, you know, you have rights as a writer and um, it, they, they shouldn't be circumscribed in, in that way. Can I just jump in and say amen to that? Because it's not just for books, it's also for articles. And so I, because I write about fashion too, I've tried to get images published and they were charging me $10,000 to reproduce, you know, and so of course I didn't do it, but it, it's, I tried fair use and nope, it didn't work. So I, no, that is poetic. I need to hear that again as I'm still okay. writing articles. You can so. email us anytime, we'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so very much to our panelists for such incredible insights. Um, thank you to Tim for shepherding the, gr the great questions and to all of the um, folks who asked questions and for the future recipients of the library tote bag. Um, 
please enjoy the rest of your day and we'll send a link around with um, uh, the video from, from this so you can revisit it for inspiration anytime. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>